How are you, mate? We're in a room together. I, it's weird. I can touch you. Please don't. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> please, please don't. Too late. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been, I don't think we've ever been done it in the same room except in a pub. In a pub, yeah. The only, this, yeah. Is, this is old. This is uh, the first time we've done it in a... Uh, you're smaller than I expected. What, the real, real world? No, you. Oh, me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, um... You're tidier than I expected. <laughs> I certainly am not. Yes. Um, and we're at Sepa Towers as well. We are, yeah, That's in the office. Um, yeah. Leave Boudoir. Yeah, yeah, with staff in the building, which is good. It is nice, yeah. Um, this, that's, this is the little room, there's the big room. This is the little room, the, the Newton big, Suite. Can this become the big room? It can become the big room. We can on, I didn't know it was called the Newton Suite. The Newton Suite, yeah. After... Um, Figs. Fig Newtons? No, after... Um, is it William Newton? The... Bob. Bob Newton. One of the first patent attorneys. And he's busted oh, in the corner over there. But not Isaac Newton. No, it's not Isaac Newton. Okay, because he invented gravity. You yeah, should have patented that. <laughs> Lee Davis and Gwilym Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Should we um, should we introduce our guests? Because yeah. so, we're this is inane chatters going nowhere, really, is it? <laughs> Go, go, go. So, probably should say first off that this is, um, I think, the final one of our Earthshot podcasts. Right. So, um, so as you know, we've been having um, all of the nominees on to come and tell us their stories. I'm really interested in they've been too. So, um, welcome to you both. Would you care to introduce yourselves? Because you know more about you than we do. We offered to each introduce each other, but let's do it this way. <laughs> uh, so, my name's John Archer. Uh, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of Hutan Bio, our algal biofuel company, and I'm somewhat overawed and honoured to be included in a, a lineup of some seriously good people who are all doing their best to transform what we do now to address climate change into the new, greener and more efficient world. So it's uh, lovely to be here in, what did you call, Sepa Towers. Sepa Towers, 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 yeah. On the second floor thereof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's the only floor we've got. (laughs) Lee Lee normally sits at the top, root combing his hair. (laughs) Both of them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hairier than I expected, actually. (laughs) It's Cathy, who are you? I'm Cathy Lumsden, and I'm a patent attorney working at Slingsby Partners. And I'm part of the team there who've been working with Hooten Bio for about a year, and we're focusing on their IP strategy and particularly on their engineering and chemistry innovations. Cool. Well, welcome both. Thank and you. as you said, John, it's been it's been so great to get to hear the stories behind the nominees mm. because um, obviously there's only so much you can pick out through the nomination process. So it's been really really cool to have people on and have these conversations. You're not the first person we've had on the podcast who's doing interesting things with stuff in the sea. So um, so seventy percent of the world is the sea. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we had a really uh, interesting podcast, didn't we, about seaweed? But two about seaweed. Two about yeah. seaweed, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. so the, the sea seems to be the answer to lots of our... Maybe 70% problems. of our podcasts should be about the sea. Should be about the sea. Just, yeah. Oh no, then again, most of them should be about outer space if we're going to do that game, so that's not... There's loads, there's loads of that. Dark uh, matter. Dark <laughs> matter, there we go. That could be the new name for the podcast. <laughs> so, should we start at the beginning? Yeah. Who, who tan bio? How did it come about? So... You know, it's, it's a typical university spin-out coming out from Cambridge and Kaust. In 2019, myself, uh, Dr. Norris Le Noctar and Ms. Suhaiza uh, Ahmed Jambor, both ladies, both exceptional, founded the company. And its purpose is to develop and commercialise our low-carbon biofuel technology so that we can address the elephant in the room, which is, you know, we're all looking at electric cars. I looked at one, it was a Chinese one from Geely, it's really good, really <laughs> cheap. Um, th- that'd be fine for us, but we have got ships and we've got, to an extent, trains in some parts of the world, but mostly ships, uh, aviation, of course, and long distance heavy land transport. Mm-hmm. And all of those are. Typically, the assets are very capital intensive. They're in operation nearly all the time, and they are economically essential. And as we know from the tragedy in in Ukraine, where the grain has been held up by the activities of the belligerent Russia, 
people starve if you don't get grain into ships. You, you, can't, you can't bring it out any other way, as well as every other thing. So we are targeting primarily marine, marine fuel, and then uh, diesel fuel for, for lorries, and then finally uh, long distance fuel uh, for aviation. And the key thing is that our, our breakthrough, our, our disruption is we're not disruptive. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you have to explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of talk about we can change to hydrogen or ammonia yeah, yeah. and so yeah. on. The difficulty is that you know a ship costs tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars. The engine is the size of this building. You can't say, um, and it's also in operation all the time. Yeah, yeah. You can't say, listen, fellas, we're going to pull the engine out and do something to it, and we're also going to change how you fuel it, how you run it. What's the safety procedures and so on? The shipping companies are looking for is something that looks like marine fuel, but has a negative carbon footprint. And will we grow our algae on flue gas, which they absolutely love? Then you get exactly that. And you can put that in as a blend. And so you can wean people off these high carbon polluting fuels into a cyclic carbon. Yeah. So, you know, we're not saying this is and that, a miracle. That, and that was where I got myself slightly confused when I was doing my... Uh, I always do a little bit of research for the podcast. Quinn does none, obviously. I always do a little bit of research. And I'm looking at it thinking, it's still a hydrocarbon fuel. Mm-hmm. It's still... Mm-hmm. There are still... Uh, my background's in plumbing and heating, so um, there, well, yeah. there are still products of combustion here. And then I, I, I it tweaked. It was like, yeah, but it's CO2 in, CO2 out. Mm. It's, yeah, you're, it's you're taking it out of the atmosphere. Yeah creating the fuel is going back again. Now, so. for every every kilo or tonne of fuel, we fix two tonnes, almost two tonnes, of, of CO2. So what you're actually doing is pulling CO2 out of the air. Here's the, the sort of drivers for us. We looked at this as, as the global challenge that we think we can address and believe we can. How do you not only change the fuel for long distance transport to a better for the environment fuel, but still very similar to the one you're using now. Some of the marine alternative fuels are so toxic that you know nobody wants them really. And green hydrogen is yet to appear. Yeah. And if you put green hydrogen on the ship, you're gonna to have to cryopreserve cryogenically store it or the ship will carry one bag of chips and the rest will be... (laughs) (laughs) More of a Zeppelin than a ship. (laughs) Yeah, it could be a Zeppelin. So, you know, for the time being, it's a transitional technology. It's going to be generating CO2, but it will be removing twice as much per, per kilo as it goes along. And you don't have to throw a new standard operating procedure across the world. Yeah. Right? So that That sounds really exciting. It is quite exciting and we've got tremendous sort of advice and help and engagement with uh, marine shipping companies and they want to do the right thing. They're, they're literally, they know they've got to cut their CO2, they want to cut it. Uh, one captain said to me, look, I don't want anything happening to my engines when I'm coming into port, you know. I'm, I'm driving something, a super tanker, a, a VLCC. This thing is massive. You don't mess about with those things because they, they can cause all sorts of pro- problems if they crash into something. So they, they're really engaging on that. It's really exciting because I, I've always liked ships. It's easy, <laughs> but, but now I can look at them and go, hmm, that's a VLCC. And, and did you decide to start with shipping because there's a obvious natural fit in terms of the way the fuel works or yeah 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 i mean the thing with the ships is that they, they're burning resi- residual fuel oil which is something that looks like asphalt or they're burning marine gas oil which is a, a, a form of diesel uh, and our oil so you know talking about technology what our cells do is they produce basically a light diesel right and that was part of the the approach we took I mean, the elephant in the room is always algae failed, right? In, in the 2000s, there was a huge push on algal fuels and it didn't work. Well, let's just take a step back. What you were talking about was a new agriculture, right? You're going to start growing algae and make fuel. 
algae made the oil in the first place, but it took millions of years. Yeah. So let's just use algae. But it turns out there's about a million species of algae, <laughs> uh, of which 33,000 exist in university strain libraries, of which they are very often repeats of the same thing. You're looking at a tiny, tiny subset. And these are strains identified for academic purposes, not for industrial purposes. So we looked at what the industrial environment would be for a large-scale new agriculture, and then we set out, as our ancestors did at the beginning of, of farming. You know, they went out and found wheat and corn. You know, they didn't try planting all sorts of things like rhododendrons. <laughs> You know, they, they went out and found the things that grew well and produced something you could, could use, could eat. So that's the way we took it. So the oil we produce was one of the features, because you, you could make something like palm oil, which is great if you wanted to replace palm oil. But no, we want to replace diesel, so you want to have short chain length material. It sounds like your science team's quite a wide spectrum of ability then you may be the science, I know you're chief science officer yeah. Yeah. no the, the team are phenomenal so as Lynn regrettably she can't be here she's back in, in Malaysia running our operations there uh, she got a PhD in Cambridge really brilliant scientist and has a feeling for the algae that is rather rather stunning. She's like, no. I don't think I did, thought I'd ever hear someone say on the podcast yeah. got a feeling for the algae. She does. <laughs> she, she understands them at a sort of fundamental level. And it's a bit like the film Evolution. I'm a bit scared at the moment. This no, is no, no. <laughs> I knew a new brewer who was fascinated by yeast and had quite an emotional relationship with it. So it's the same kind of thing, I guess. It is, because you, you, get to, you get to study them. I mean, we looked at a trillion colonies. Okay. No, no, no joke. That's how many we went until we found these guys. And we weren't looking for them. What we were looking for was a characteristic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So for the London Olympics, there was a push, particularly in some of the sports that were relatively, you could pick them up quite well, was to find people the right shape and size. And they went round looking for, you know, big six foot tall people and said, here, have a rowing oar, and off you go, and it works. So what we did is we, we basically said we want to have these characteristics and we are pretty good at setting up those kind of screens and then out came this group all on its own and it's completely unknown. Can I, can I ask one more like daft question that only I ask before you get into the proper techie stuff, Gwilym, is that all right? Mm -hmm. How long does it take from sort of like raw material to usable fuel? What's the sort of time? Because you said millions of years if it was doing it naturally. If it's not a question you can no, answer, John, then don't answer no, it. No, it's, it's, it, it's measured in month, months, okay. month, month. Yeah. So if you think about the most efficient oil crop on the planet in agricultural use right now is palm tree. Mm -hmm. Now, the latest palm trees have been genetically engineered, so you can start getting oil after five years. Ours is better, months yeah. as opposed to years. And at the, about 20 years, you have to knock it all down because the, the yields drop, mm -hmm. whereas ours just keep going. So I think the key thing is we target semi-arid and arid areas. So it's what temperature we were discussing today, was it 20, 21 is your favourite yeah, temperature, right? temperature, which is about what we have here. <laughs> now, it for yourself or for your algae? For myself. For I don't, I don't, no. but sadly, I don't have any don't of my algae, algae there, right? well, That could be our end question, how much algae have you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you look at anywhere that's green or blue on the planet, it's already doing photosynthesis. Right? Yeah. If it's the sea, 50% of all the carbon is fixed by algae in the sea. Yeah. Green on the land, well, you have algal you know, derivatives, plants and the like, all these, these things. But if we, if we think about biofuels, what we're generally doing is, at the moment, we're moving, sadly, food from, from people's tables, typically poor people's tables, and putting it in rich people's cars. Right. Right? Yeah. We don't particularly like that as a concept. What we like is the idea that we go somewhere that doesn't have much in the way of things growing. It's brown, it's, it's semi-arid desert. And so we set it up so the organisms actually can function there and they don't use fresh water, not a drop. 
and there's quite a bit of technology in, in doing that, but fundamentally we don't use fresh water. So we don't interfere with fresh water, which is the other elephant in the room, is all of this would use a huge amount of water. Yeah. So we, we want to be away from food, away from fresh water, and going to semi-arid and arid areas. And we are in discussions, early discussions, with a number of uh, locations in, in Africa that could, uh, could host our first major site. You have proof of concept. Oh, yeah. um, you, you've sort of you produced small quantities, yeah. that kind of thing. So you're at a stage now where you need to scale up to. Yeah. Uh, it's about so where the company is going now is the biology is very strong. The engineering is rapidly evolving, and the engineering is about making a system that operates with relatively uh, hardworking, but not scientific or technical people, so that this can go into these semi-arid and desert areas and actually be sources of economy and, and jobs for people who otherwise don't have it. Yeah. Right? So the electronics, the engineering, the control systems are all part of the magic that is running the, the farms. Okay? So you talked about proof of principle. One of the aspects that had been a huge problem before with previous algal groups is their organisms are they basically make sugar so they're like donuts <laughs> they're, mm, they're really nice and tasty yum 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 and <laughs> all sorts of uh, nasty bacteria and plankton birds and fish will come and eat them and so they would literally die they'd be eaten to death die viruses would kill them they couldn't take the harsh conditions we've been running ours in deserts jungles, both of which have their, their threats. Deserts, mm. it's hot. Jungles, it's full of nasty things that want to kill you uh, and eat your, eat your algae. And we've never had a crash. That is a world first. Okay. So we can grow continuously on non-sterile seawater. We filter it to get sand out because sand will interfere with mm. pumps and whatever yeah. you do yeah. in the downstream process. And so that is very exciting you know when we, when we achieved our first year of operations we were like wow and what sort of scale when you're up and running and you're yeah. fueling super tankers what kind of <laughs> literally how big are the how big so are you'll be uh, basically you're going to get on our calculations based on what we've done now and every one of them and I can't tell you those numbers, apparently, because I'm going to give them a look at you. Uh, <laughs> Under the table. Yeah. All of those numbers have been generated. It's not like we, we pick a number we've never seen. We, and we, we're not picking our best number. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are inside our operational maximum revs, massively inside. Because when you go for large-scale agriculture, you know, you're, you're going to be running at less than optimal conditions. And uh, when we've done that, a, a one kilometre square farm will generate... A, a significant a amount significant. of oil, I think is how we'll, we'll phrase it for now, but yeah. it's, it's an impressive number. It, 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 is, it is quite, quite good. Um, he said staggering. <laughs> um, you, you actually get a business that pays well, right? Because the thing is, there's got to be a business. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the idea, the company is a technology company. And we sell that technology on with, you know, service packages and so on to landowners and governments, supply training and so on. Um, and we, we, we think that it's the, the fact it runs on no fresh water, the fact it runs in semi-arid and desert, the fact that its biggest energy requirement is in the daytime. So if you, you have solar, mm -hmm. you don't, you know, at night, Everyone goes to bed, including the algae. So it's it's kind of a sweet spot, right? And I, I think that our, our initial commercial activities right now are all about de-risking at scale. Mm -hmm. right? we, we, we're growing multi-ton quantities of culture medium, okay? And we've had ISO testing of, of the fuel, and the fuel looks pretty good. We've run it in little tiny diesel engines, uh, but of course the capital costs of, of a, a ship engine or a, or a lorry mm. engine is, is high, and so the next phase is actually working with the engine manufacturers to test and run 
So I, I'm told they have a, a thing called a research engine, costs millions, has one cylinder, doesn't go anywhere, but <laughs> they can do all sorts of things and get data on what does the fuel do. Because the idea is that our fuel is a low carbon. Now, remember, I'm saying low carbon. If we grow it on fuel, flu gas, according to the accounting, it's carbon negative. But I like to keep on the, on the what's the word, the cautious side. Yeah. Right? You may have to move it, right? Yeah. Well, that isn't done with moonbeams and, and cucumbers. It's, it's done with a lorry. So there will be a cost. You know, the negativity of the, the CO2 there work, it, is significant. So, you know, if you do it in the right places, you won't have to move it very far. And if you do that, then you, you actually really cut well to wake emissions for ships, which is the hardest one to do. And you do it without telling them, right, fellas, we're going to fill the forecastle with ammonia. Oh, don't worry about the toxicity and the leaks. It'll be just fine. Oh, yeah, it's not as energy dense. So we're going to take one third of the ship and turn that over to a fuel. What do you mean? What happened to my cargo? <laughs> you know, our one, it's basically an additive and it will go in and slowly over time it will work in due course. Already you're seeing uh, dual fuel ships burning liquid natural gas, right? Uh, they tend to burn normal fuel on the deep sea, and then when they get close to uh, ports, they can switch, or if they're going a short distance, a ferry, for instance. Mm, yeah. But when you're out at sea, you need fuel that works every day without trouble. Right? And so our thing is go in, in a sense, with the same SOP, the same use and the same energy density, so that they don't have to change the ship. Lots of IP questions. I, I was thinking that you probably want to get some IP stuff in. But before, any moment there, Cathy. Um, <laughs> just one, actually, one more question, uh, John, which is, it sounds like there's quite a lot of investment sitting behind this. Have you found it easy to get funding? Or? Well, the three founders put their own money into it quite a considerable amount. Okay. It's interesting talking to venture capitalists and they find that out and they're like, oh God, really? <laughs> um, yes, it's, it, we made the, the discovery and we all thought very hard mm -hmm. and we thought maybe someone can take it on or something like that. And it was clear that we were in the best position to do it and so we started. And we've now got angel investment as well, and you know we're in active conversations with venture capital. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert at this, right? Uh, Paul <laughs> Paul Beastel, our CEO, is brilliant. Right. Okay, unfortunately, he's talking to the, that last class of people this very day, so <laughs> he's not here now. Uh, but Paul brings commercial focus. His uh, he's incredibly experienced. His entire active business life has been about commercializing high tech, bringing technology into viable businesses. Okay, and so he's our CEO and chair. And he's brought a much needed commercial focus because when it's all said and done, we the scientists are a small part of a much larger team. Yeah. And we're not in charge, yeah? Yes, yes, I know we have all these big IQ things and doctorates and all that, but it turns out in this field, you need people who know what they're doing. Yeah. And so it's about a team, and Kathy has brought, and her team have brought phenomenal focus on the steps to build the company up so that it de-risks and is therefore a clearer investment propo uh, proposition to, uh, to people who want to uh, help us make a difference. And this is a classic example where you are currently just IP, uh, you've got proof of concept, but it's all up here, and it's, I'm pointing my head on an yeah. audio podcast. Um, uh, it's all up there, but turning to the IP side of things, you've, you've got quite a lot going on there by the look of it, and quite a w wide range of technologies. So what's, what's your background, first of all? My background is in chemistry. And okay. At Slingsby, we're focusing on the chemistry and the engineering side of things. The, okay. the biology having been the, the main focus of, of the company for so long, and, and that's what everything's built on. But now to scale up, it's really about it's the chemistry, it's the processes, sure. it's the engineering and the hardware behind it. And it's, it's our role to work with John and team to look at which IP we could file now. Yeah. What are we ready to go with? Which IP is nearly there, needs a bit more time, maybe a bit more experimenting, and also looking to the future. 
what do we need to do, which problems do we need are going to be solved. And we have this uh, spreadsheet, which I love, good. with a list of all these different options which we can regularly review, and it helps get a, a good picture of the IP position of where are we now, what are we working towards, what are those timescales for that, and actually in the future we've got a, that pipeline coming of future applications yeah. as it's scaled up and as you realise the important things for doing this at, at scale and for doing this with um, people who aren't scientists and need to be able to follow the instructions and keep their algae alive and keep generating the oil. So it's it's a big prospect in terms of the amount of IP to farm and I think it's very easy as a patent attorney to say here's the 20, 30, 300 patent applications that we think you should file right now. But Hidden Bio is a startup, yes. and we need to balance very much <laughs> yes. the budget. And the budget doesn't all go to IP because it's very important they do all those experiments for the scaling up and mm -hmm. have trial sites, and that's a huge part of things. So it's having that continual dialogue and working out what's important to protect right now, what we think will be important in the future, and thinking not only about the costs of uh, generating and filing this IP, but John and his team's time that will need to be spent looking at applications, explaining things to us, sure. checking things sure. are correct, and it's getting that balance. And over time, there will be more IP, mm -hmm. and at the beginning, yeah. there is necessarily less IP. There yeah. would be the absolute perfect position, but nobody can afford to have the absolute perfect position because mm -hmm. otherwise you couldn't develop the technology. No, of course. No, it sounds really like exciting pro project to be involved in, actually. I um, should say we filed... Am I allowed to say the company names, or is that not allowed? Whose company? Whose company names? You and... Yes. yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, Slingsby... Oh, no, absolutely, yeah, of course, <laughs> no, of course you can. So yeah. we, have, we have two companies. We have Mew and Ellis, who are covering the biology. Mm -hmm. Simon Kramer uh, couldn't be with us today, uh, but very, very strong on mm -hmm. that. Slingsby, immensely strong on the engineering. And so we, we have... The biology side is, is we filed last year, you know, rolling things out now with Slingsby. And, and everything Cathy says is, is absolutely what we need because we are, we are a small, tiny group. Sorry to interrupt, I just wanted That's to fine. make sure that it was clear we had filed on the biology. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're a fairly new startup, you've been involved for a year at yeah. Slingsby, so um, I guess it's all kind of early stage unpublished. Yeah, Stuff. everything's unpublished. Yeah, um, cool. so. But obviously, need important to think at this early stage about where we'd eventually file, because semi-arid countries are not traditionally places where you'd necessarily file the patent yeah. applications. Mm -hmm. And it's working out where it's important to get protection, and thinking about you want to really get protection for the farms where you might manufacture that equipment, where you might process the oil, where you might use the oil, and taking into account um, the restrictions of, for patents for ships and aircrafts and temporarily oh, so waters. You've got, a, you've got a nice crossover between the countries you're making it and the vehicles mm. that you're using. Yeah. So yeah. You, you can be quite strategic and think and where is important for the different types of technology. Do you know who your competitors are possibly? That's always useful to know when you're making your strategy up, isn't it? Yeah, and do you want me to answer that? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know who yeah, they are. Um, Exxon poured quite a bit of money into a company, but uh, it took a different route to ours, mm. uh, which was to, and it was a perfectly reasonable scientific proposition to say, we can build with synthetic biology a, an organism to your exact needs, a bespoke Savile Row tailored <laughs> organism. Uh, it turns out that evolution's been doing this for 3.8 billion years, and synthetic biology, which we ourselves do, is great in the lab, but when you take it outside, the cells are not as strong. Yeah. Uh, and it turned out that we cheated. We asked Mother Nature, please, Mum, can we have something that really grows well, super strong, da -da 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 -da, and makes really good oil? And did you get lucky? Is that was there an element well, of, you, you mentioned discovery at the beginning. Yeah. That's quite interesting. So yeah, geneticists are always, and we're all geneticists in the team. We are always about screening and numbers. Okay, <laughs> we look for incredibly rare events by having a lot of organisms to test. That's that's why we don't work on elephants because they take thirty six months to have a baby or something like that. It's too long. So fruit flies are easier. Fruit flies, <laughs> yes. Uh, the Department of Genetics became very famous for fruit flies. And uh, a shout out to the guys there. Uh, Big the, up. The, what we did is we set up screens that looked at organisms, and we did it in such a way that we could automate some parts of it. And we, we used a lot of biological genetic 
trickery to we, we don't do GM okay yeah to to find the the organisms that can satisfy I'm making a triangle with my hands for the audience at home, uh, which is describing a, a kind of hyperdimensional space of, of phenotypic characteristics. So if you're in here, you're a good industrial organism. If you're out there, you're not. And so we looked for organisms that fell into this, and that's when we made the discovery of this completely new genus. I mean, it's new, very unknown. Uh, but that isn't surprising because, you know, we're still finding new fish. Yeah. Looking in the North Sea, you'll find a new fish every so often. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Our understanding of the marine environment is very poor. And interesting, we talk a lot, of, it's not surprising about patents on this, but it sounds to me like you've got a few secrets and a bit of know-how and stuff like that knocking around too. So mm. well, how, how, do you, how do you manage that side of it? We don't talk about that so much on we the don't, podcast. No, that's no. quite interesting. And, and I think that comes part of the, the brainstorming and the considering of the ideas and can we get something through, is this something that you can possibly keep secret? How easy is it somebody to find out what the answer is? And it's all part of that, that bigger picture discussion about where should we be filing and what should we be doing and at which stage should we make these filings? And at which, is there anything that needs to be delayed so that the company is a bit more established so that you can then potentially file those in more jurisdictions? And it's all part of this fabulous puzzle of trying to mm. work out what we should do now, what we should do later. And I think it has to be a continual discussion mm. and it's always adjusted. And things will change when commercial things happen and things happen in the patent sphere. But that's what it's about. It's about working together with John and his team to make sure they're continually in the best position they can be and adjusting that as those commercial goals change. Yeah. And that, as well as the patent attorney side of things, the strategy is what's really interesting and what's where we hope we can make the biggest difference to empower John and team to make the decisions, to have the information they need to make that commercial call and understanding that they won't always be able to go for the patent perfect position because the commercial considerations are always the most important. Yeah. But they just need to understand the risks yeah. Yeah. and that's okay. And that's what our job is, to provide that information and that guidance. But the commercial decision is what matters. Yeah. And longer term, what are the plans for using the IP? Do you see yourself licensing out? Do you see yourself creating a kind of your own business that others can't get near? How's it going to work? I think the present model, uh, speaking purely as a CSO, of course, <laughs> uh, you'll need to talk to someone in our division on this. <laughs> uh, but the, the present model, Paul has, has developed a very strong model, which is... Uh, if you would imagine um, a landowner, probably government, who's got, or um, think of a very large island on this planet with a lot of mining on one side. Yeah. <laughs> All of the money for the mining company is underneath the ground. So to them, the top of the ground, which is semi-arid, isn't doing anything for them. Mm -hmm. So they would say, by George, or the Australian equivalent, and um, they would say, gosh, why, why can't we engage with these chaps to convert our waste CO2 into a valuable product using the free sunlight? So this would be the kind of way that you would provide a, our technology would be delivered in a cost-effective, weight-effective, almost IKEA level of containers, and it rolls out, and then we send a team in that build it up, get it going, train people, and then you have a, a you know an iterative. Uh, upgrading scheme and so on and support and, and, and so on and in the first days it's going to be more intensive but eventually it will become a, a thing you do and hopefully that then does two things provides good decent jobs and, uh, I've lived in hot countries and it's not nice being outside uh, so a good decent job for people who don't have PhDs because there are not so many of them uh, PhD centers. and you know this is good for people. If they have jobs, they're happy. And if they're making low carbon fuel, we're all happy. That's, that's as far as our commercialization has gone, as far as I understand it. But mm. Paul is the one to ask. Yeah. And IP gives you the ability to choose, make your decisions later, but have that control. Yeah. So how did it feel to be nominated for Earthshot? Let's talk a little bit about the Earthshot sort of awards itself. Deeply humbling. <laughs> I've never been... You know when people played football, I was never the one they picked. <laughs> I was a kid at the no end. The feeling, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. um, we, we, we were really shocked, you know, to even be considered. The team are truly amazing. You know, I, I'm sorry that we're not in Malaysia and you could meet them all. Um, oh, we'll come, we'll come down with yeah. 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 we're, we're, we're 19 kilometres from KLIA. <laughs> 
at the international airport in Malaysia, they were stunned, and they all, they, in Asia, everyone has a mobile phone on the whole time. You can have a meeting and half of them still. <laughs> and they're like, Earthshot, wow. It was truly humbling. I mean, we're doing our best, our science, you know, we, we can keep to ourselves our, our view on science, but we're pretty confident the science is good. Uh, external review seems to support that. But no one's ever said, gosh, you fellas might actually make a difference. Yeah. It makes us want to work even longer. And I think the thing that we've learned about Earthshot is winning's amazing, isn't it? Of course, because you get all of that publicity, whack of dosh, mm. to, to invest back into the, um, into the business. But actually, uh, Neil, by deputy, who's been leading on the Earthshot nominations, he's off to New York in a couple of weeks' time to look at um, how previous Earthshot nominees have been supported. So it's not it's not about the winners. This is about the big community that's mm. now being developed of of everyone in, in, who in the past has been involved in that. And that, to me, seems to be the big win out of this. Isn't necessarily the award and the prize, but it's being in that ecosystem of fellow inventors yeah. and movers in there. In the I mean, we're, we're going through the most fundamental change in society and in industry, economy and energy ever, right? We've been burning sticks of wood since we kind of developed fire, yeah. right? Yeah. And the Industrial Revolution, we started burning more than wood. And we've been doing that for 150 plus years. Right? But now, it's clear we, we, we can't be doing that anymore. But we are, as, a, as a, a globe, we are dependent on high energy density fuel to shift stuff about, you know, foodstuffs, essential medicines, everything is being shipped. 80 to 90% of everything comes by ship. And I keep getting back to the ship because it is the big hard one to, yeah. to solve. Aviation, to an extent, if it, it means that the, the airplane tickets are going to get more expensive. But if you can't go to, uh, you know, Spain for your holidays by airplane, you could go by train, right? You could go by ship. But if you can't shift fuel, food, bulk, and fashion items wherever they come from, you know, it makes an effect that is, is, is really significant. And so to be part of that, it requires more than one. It's, it is an ecosystem. Yeah. And things like the Earth Shot, getting companies, they, they could be a company that's got something that really could help us. Yeah. Right? Uh, I note that some there already uh, based in Africa look interesting because they are doing social uh, activities to engage uh, local people in changing habits and improving the carbon footprint and improving yeah. condition. This is the kind of thing you could imagine if one day we have got a bio farm in, in a semi-arid area. Typically these areas are um, relatively poor, sparsely populated, but you would then begin to have a a nexus that could start to develop, and I've seen this in, in some parts of uh, desert areas, that you have a, an agricultural, say, an uh, aquaponic or whatnot farm, and it starts to develop, a local village will move. Yeah. Because people tend to move in these areas because one piece of sand is much like another piece of sand, so they, they move about, but they will come in and then they start houses, they start uh, training schools, maybe a hospital, you know, it starts to build the basis of a, a, of a better way to live, perhaps, uh, certainly a more economically profitable way to live for the local people, uh, and, ha and they're in control of it. It's, it's their system. We just supplied the tools. So I think it feels like we're coming towards the end. Well, it's at the beginning and the middle. Yeah, yeah, but of a podcast. Yeah, yes. not the end of... Um, Society, society. Yeah, it's well, right. too. No, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. <laughs> the beginning. Yeah. Thank you both for um, coming in, rather it's than just appearing. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. been re really cool. Yeah. Um, so normally I'd have a closing question, but I can't think. I can't. You know, I don't know if it's because I'm here in person, 
Yeah. And I think and I think better when I'm isolated from people. I can't think of a closing question. We normally send you little secret yeah. messages, which is quite useful. Yeah. We've not been able to do We've that. We've not been able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know what you were thinking. I didn't know where you were going with like the next question because normally you would give me a little prompt. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. You I think it's more difficult in person, actually. It's. I think. I think so too. I do actually think so. Yeah. Well, I had a question about the name of the business, which isn't mm. a question for everybody yeah. because he's got a business with a name. But I've got. A, I've got. I've got a really stupid one to follow on. The oh, brilliant. Okay. As long as you. So have. just quickly, Hutan, you, mm. you mentioned before we start recording the background just quickly it's an interesting name okay. yeah it's it's bahasa it's malay bahasa is the language of pretty much indonesia malaysia goes on out um, it means forest so it's pronounced hutan hutan and orang hutan orang hutan is orang is person hutan forest so what we call an orang hutan is a forest person, forest person yeah. and the forest has been for for mankind, womankind, for people kind, has been a resource that we've used for its food, for its animals, for its wood, for its plants, for its medicinal plants. And this is a new sort of forest. So we thought it would be a forest growing in the desert. It is it is that is as far as our soft skills went. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good story, it makes a lot of sense. I haven't to um, Anthony Burgess was a big fan of speaking Malay. Yeah. Um, and Clockwork Orange is actually Orang is from Orangi Town mm. as well, doesn't it? It is. When, it when is you asked where the name came from, that's where it came from. I, I would plug Malaysia as a, a wonderful place to work. Uh, my team are fantastic. They're very kind with me murdering their language from time to time. Uh, but it, it is a, a really exciting part of the world and has roughly. UK law, so and UK plugs, oh. <laughs> which frankly is the biggest annoyment I ever had these days. Is trying to remember which plug I have to bring. Yeah, um, yeah. I've got already complicated with all the sliders on it. So Lee, if you set up a business, I was going to make you name it, but that's really unfair on Kathy and everybody. <laughs> but if you choose where to run your business from, where would you do it? What's my business? So I don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't. So it's just business future. It doesn't, well, it doesn't maybe, matter what it probably, is. Probably not plumbing because you're going to stuck with people with pipes there, aren't you? So, so where, where would I choose? So I, 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 I wouldn't have a place in mind, but it would need to have two things, I think. And guess one of them. Go on. Fishing. Fishing, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it would need to be close to shore so that I could get my fishing in, but it would also need to be close to just good walking, I think, because I think best when I'm out walking and... So I do about six miles every morning. Not today, because I stayed in London last night. So I haven't walked this morning, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I need to have those two features. Somewhere to fish and somewhere to walk. John, you've got away with it already because you've answered the question. Unless you'd rather be somewhere other than Malaysia. Well, we, I, I like to be in two places at once. So I see. We're, we're headquartered... Gosh, this is really clever, isn't it? We're headquartered in Cambridge. Okay, so that's where our HQ is. Our biology and pilot work is in Malaysia because of the sunlight and the, the facilities there, and as I mentioned, the, the similarity in law. As we go further out, we'll be in more places. And the wonderful thing is everywhere you go, you, you meet different people and learn a little bit about them. And it is it's wonderful to, to actually be able to do that and do what you love best, which is doing science and technology at the same time. It's really very, very yes. privileged condition. I would suggest you come and visit us oh, yeah, absolutely. because uh, a bang man, our engineer, is a mad keen fisherman. I mean, I have never he he, he has a rod in his car. I, in I, I have a rod in my car. Yeah. There are two things in the back of my car: squash rackets and fishing rods, right. permanently. <laughs> and, and you know, he's he's literally just waiting to go fishing the whole time. I do have I do have a name for my business, though, Gwyneth, even though this business doesn't exist. Oh, come on then. No, no, and um, so it would be Perdiscus. Right, which, which is a slight um, adaptation of the Latin to mm -hmm. um, to learn by discovery, to find out by doing. Ah, lovely. Which is the European on of course, anyway. So. Yeah. So um, yeah, I've always, I've always yeah. done what I would call it. Um, right. It would now get stolen by someone, obviously. As I <laughs> that, but, um, good luck, because I have already trademarked it. We've bought a lot of time, Kathy. <laughs> we have. I would very much like to be somewhere that's by the sea, there's lots of nice places for walks and my favourite place probably in the whole of the UK is the Isle of Wight, yeah. so I would choose to, to live in the Isle of Wight, there's uh, a large number of beaches, there's, with the internet, the type of job that we do, it's very easy to do from anywhere, yes. um, and also I trained under Helen Jones and she currently lives on the Isle of Wight and has set up a separate business there, mm -hmm. outside of IP, making cider, so I think Ooh. it'd be quite nice to 
to join in with that cider as part of a, a move to the Isle of Wight. So my morning walk is on the South Downs, so I see the Isle of Wight every morning. That's nice. Beautiful place to go. Yeah, I cycle through Camberwell, it's not quite the, uh, the sort of exotic. It's the third time the Isle of Wight's come up in recent podcasts as yeah. well. Seaweed Isle of Wight, a lot of themes. Yeah, a lot yeah. of themes. You then, mate. Where, oh, where are you? darn it. Uh, no, Chung Chow Island, Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to live there, not there. Yeah. And, but all the cool people live on Chung Chow Island. And mm. if you've ever been to Hong Kong, mm. you take the, uh, the outlying island ferry from yeah. the main terminal in Central, and you go round the island, you see the back of Hong Kong, you see the front of Hong Kong, then you see the back of Hong Kong, and then you get the Chung Chow shit, like a dumbbell. Being done. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a tiny isthmus in between two lumps. Course, yeah. And it's yeah. just beautiful, quiet, there's no cars. Uh, it's, it's, it smells of fantastic food. And um, they make oyster paste or something there. So, so. And what, I remember watching them making a wok once, beating it out. Making a wok? Yeah, out of, beating it out of a disc of metal, just smashing it over like a, a, a wok-shaped anvil. Anyway, yes, there you go, that, that was my long answer. That's it then. I think we're done. Podcast, podcast finished. It's difficult to close it, isn't it, when you're in the room? We've just all we just shut, zoomed out. We could, drop, we, could, we, could, we could drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, I'll see you all in the next one. Before